But we are in Mark chapter 5 this morning. Hopefully you're there. I'm going to be picking up where we left off last week in verse 21. We'll be reading verse 21 down through verse 34 or 43 at the end of the chapter. So Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And if you're able, would you stand as we read the Lord's word together? We read, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the, father's, uh, the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. We'll stop there. You can be seated. Father, we rejoice this morning in our great Savior. The one who we've already considered this morning would come to us as wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace the one who would rule on David's throne forever and who promises the deliverance of his people, the one who turns gloom into glory, anguish into rejoicing. And so, God, we come today in the name of the Lord Jesus under his banner confessing his gospel and rejoicing in his power to save and in the many, many other wonderful works that he does. And so, Lord, as we look to the scripture this morning, we pray that you would help us. Help us to see the Lord Jesus in all of his glory, to help us to get glimpses of his mercy, to see the compassion that he shows to those who are in need, to recognize his power, and to honor him as Lord. To have a proper fear of the Lord, a proper dread even of the Lord, as Isaiah showed us this morning, but to take rest to find our hiding place, our sanctuary in him. God, we rejoice in our Savior. Help us as we consider his life this morning. We pray in his name. Amen. Mark chapter 5 has sometimes been called the St. Jude chapter of the Bible. In Roman Catholicism, St. Jude is considered to be the patron saint of lost causes. And while I by no means want you to think that I would endorse the idolatrous idea of sainthood as it is taught by the Roman Catholic Church, I, I do understand the reference that they're making. 
In reality, you, could conclude, you can include chapters 4 and 5 in this assessment. Chapter 4 begins with Jesus teaching in a series of parables to tell about the kingdom of God. He talks about the importance of sowing seed of the gospel through faithful teaching and preaching and discipleship, while explaining to us that not every seed that is sown is going to produce a harvest. At the same time, when Jesus' following was very small, at least in terms of true believers, when he was already hated by the religious leaders of his day who were plotting his death, Jesus taught his disciples that if they kept on sharing the good news of the gospel, if they kept shining the light of the gospel into the darkness of this world, eventually they would reap a harvest that would exceed even their greatest expectations. Like a mustard seed that grew from the smallest seed into a towering plant that overshadowed the rest of the garden, the kingdom of God would start small but become something very great. It would reach into every corner of the earth. What looked like a lost cause would ultimately prevail. At the end of chapter 4, we saw Jesus and his disciples in a boat in the middle of the sea caught up in a terrible storm. Jesus was asleep, exhausted from his day of teaching and likely teaching the disciples a lesson. But the disciples themselves were terrified. Remember, these are experienced fishermen. They had spent several of them their very lives out on that sea in those boats. They knew how to respond to whatever the sea might bring them, but this storm apparently was unlike any other they had ever experienced, and they were certain that they were going to perish. When they woke up Jesus, they rebuked him for not caring about them and what was about to happen to them, but when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the storm. He calmed the seas with a simple word. He rebuked the disciples also for their lack of faith. But when all had seemed loss, Jesus brought peace and calm and safety. The disciples were going to live to sail another day. Last week, we looked at the first part of chapter 5. After battling this storm on the sea, Jesus and his disciples reached their destination on the other side, on the eastern side of the sea, immediately confronted by a man who had long been tormented by a legion of evil spirits, a man who had been alienated from other people, a man who was forced to wander out in the wilderness. He lived in a mountainside cemetery where, a cemetery where he went without any clothes, and he regularly cut himself with the jagged rocks that lay around him. He shouted obscenities and threatened violence toward anyone who came near. On numerous occasions, we read that people had tried to subdue him, but no one had been able to succeed. They had bound him in shackles and chains in hopes of getting him under control, but the supernatural strength that he had received from these evil spirits within him had allowed him to break his bonds to pieces. By this point, when Jesus arrives, everyone else had given up on him. Everyone else had thought this was it. There's no one who can do anything with him. They had avoided even going through the area anymore because this man could not be controlled. When Jesus and his disciples arrived, we see that this man rushed toward them, likely intent on violence, but instead he found deliverance. Jesus knew what was going on. He began to rebuke the evil spirits, and immediately the man fell at the Lord's feet, and these spirits began to cry out. But Jesus rebuked these spirits, and he sent them away. And when the crowds arrived to see what had happened, what did they find? This man was seated, he was fully clothed. He was in his right mind, as if nothing had ever gone wrong. Everyone else had written him off as a lost cause. They had given up on him, but Jesus gave him new life. And that brings us to our passage this morning. In the latter part here of Mark chapter 5, we find not one lost cause, but two. And really, we have two very different people with two very different backgrounds and very different needs. Warren Wearsby comments on this, and I think he does a good job showing us how God works in the lives of all sorts of people by giving us kind of a contrast between these two. Listen to what he writes. He says, the contrast between these two needy people is striking, and it reveals the wideness of God's love and mercy. Jairus was an important synagogue officer, and the woman was an anonymous nobody, yet Jesus welcomed and helped both of them. Jairus was about to lose a daughter who had given him 12 years of happiness, and this woman was about to lose an affliction that had brought her 12 years of sorrow. Being a synagogue officer, Jairus had no doubt, was no doubt wealthy, but his wealth could not save his dying daughter. The woman was already bankrupt. She had given the doctors all of her money, and yet none of them could cure her. Both Jairus and the woman found answers to their needs at the feet of Jesus. 
The stories of these two people are intertwined. It was Jairus who first came to Jesus. And as Jesus is headed to his house to minister to his family, this woman comes to the forefront. And so Jesus deals with her before continuing on with Jairus. But both, we see, receive a great gift from the Lord. So we want to work our way through this passage, read the scripture here, hear their stories, and see if we can draw from this some thoughts for ourselves in our day. Verse 21 begins telling us that Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. After a short trip to the Gerasene wilderness on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where he had helped this demon-possessed man, Jesus had arrived back on the western shore in the region near Capernaum. Now, that's, that's something we've talked about several times as we work through this gospel. This is a place that Jesus has spent a good deal of his time. He had ministered there in the earlier chapters of this gospel, and apparently it didn't take long at all for the crowds to gather again, uh, wanting to see Jesus, wanting to experience his miracles. In fact, if you read this account in Luke's gospel, you'll see that, that they had been waiting for his return, and they welcomed him back as soon as he arrived. So word was spreading everywhere about Jesus' ability to heal, the miracles he had done in so many ways, and we can be sure that there, there were many among this crowd, I think, who were probably looking for a healing touch from the Lord. Now, as we've seen, these, these gatherings could get pretty chaotic. You, you look at what's been happening so far in Jesus' ministry, the crowds would press in on Jesus from every direction, everywhere he went, and so uh, everyone wanted a chance to be touched by him or to uh, even to just touch him themselves. They were looking for any opportunity to be near to the Lord because they believed that he could deliver them. And sometimes this became too intense. Uh, we saw the last time as Jesus was teaching among these crowds that he had called for a boat so that he could push offshore and be separated from these crowds, lest he and his disciples be crushed. But in the midst of all this chaos, at a time when likely there are many people who are being healed, being delivered, there's one man who comes to the forefront. We read there in verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. So we meet this man named, named Jairus, and we're told that he's one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now, only, only God knows why, why certain accounts make it into the Gospels. But, but this one is, is certainly interesting. Jesus reached out to all sorts of people, but this man was unique uh, among many that the Lord ministered. And to that, he was one of the rulers in the local Jewish synagogue. Now, I want us to think a little bit about what that means. What, what, what did it mean for him to be a ruler in the synagogue? How was he different from any other religious figure, these that Jesus has encountered along the way? Now, one commentator explained it this way. He said the synagogue officials were a group of men, usually numbered between three and seven, in each local synagogue, who acted as the caretakers and administrators of synagogue life. They safeguarded the scrolls. They cared for the facility. They organized the synagogue school. They supervised the readers, the teachers, and those who prayed. As such, Jairus would have been both religiously devout and highly respected in the Jewish religious community. None of the gospel writers identified Jairus as a member of the Pharisees. Even so, his position in the synagogue meant he was intimately connected with the Pharisaic establishment of Capernaum. He was undoubtedly aware of the hatred the religious leaders had toward Jesus, yet he was willing to very publicly seek his help. Verse 22, in fact, tells us this man came to Jesus and he fell at his feet, and there's good reason for that. This man's desperate. He doesn't know what else to do. We learn in the verses that follow that he has a daughter who's very close to death. In the Greek, it says that she has reached her eschatos. She's on the verge or of or has reached her end. We use that word eschatology when we're thinking about the end times, right? She's reached her end. Her death is imminent. The last bits of her life are leaving her. If you look at Matthew's gospel, at least in our English translation, Jairus comes to Jesus and actually says, my daughter has just died. Now, that may be a little bit confusing when you compare these accounts to each other. And I'm sure the translators had a hard time with this. In both cases, the Greek words used can refer to the girl either being newly dead or being on the verge of death. I don't suppose we can say 100% which way this ought to be understood. I think the best interpretation, given the rest of the text, is that Jairus knew his daughter's life was over if something didn't change real quick. If Jesus would not intervene, she certainly would die. 
He likely understood that she would die while he was away. I think it was that critical. He knew when he left, she's only got a few more breaths to go. And if I can't get Jesus to come and deal with something, she's lost. And so I think he knows her death is imminent. He doesn't probably expect to see her alive again. He probably knows that by the time he gets back home, she will have already passed. We don't understand exactly maybe what they're getting at here. We have these translations that are a little bit different, but we do know this much, that this man believed, whatever the circumstances for his daughter, that Jesus was the only answer. Now, it's interesting here that he comes as a ruler of the synagogue. Jairus should not have had anything to do with Jesus. You've seen the way that the religious establishment has rejected him. They've wanted nothing to do with him. They've called him a liar and a charlatan. They've accused him of doing the things he does by the power of the devil. They've been plotting his death, and Jairus would have known every bit of this. He would have known that he should not have had anything to do with this man named Jesus except for to mark him as a rebel, as a threat, as a danger. And yet, this man knew that he had nowhere else to turn. See, there was something that could not be denied. And then this is the problem that these religious leaders were coming up against all the time. Whatever they may have wanted to say about Jesus, they couldn't get around the fact that everywhere he went, the power of God was at work. Every time he shows up, what's happening? The blind receive sight. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The sick are made healthy again. Dead people live, right? There's no way around this. He would have seen the many miracles that Jesus had worked in that region of Capernaum. He would have heard the testimony about many more. He knew what happened when Jesus was in town. And he knew that no one else could help his daughter. He may not have been supposed to seek out the Lord Jesus, but we see here that his daughter became more important to him than his position or his prominence. So not only does he come looking for Jesus, but he falls at his feet and he's begging the Lord for mercy. You see what he says there? Come. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. This man is not concerned anymore for those things that would have made him somebody in that culture. He wasn't concerned about his reputation, his job, his position in society. He just knew his daughter was dying and there was one hope. Come, lay your hands on her so that she can be made well and live. He pleads with the Lord Jesus and we see in verse 24 that the Lord hears his pleas and he goes with him to heal his daughter. Now while he's on his way though to Jairus' house, the crowds are continuing to press in. On every side, the masses have gathered, each one of them seeking something from the Lord. But again, in the midst of all this chaos, we see attention being turned to one individual. In verse 25, you see a shift in the focus of this passage here, away from Jairus and his daughter to um, a certain woman. And we're not told much about this woman, except for that she had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And we're told that she had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So here's a woman who had spent 12 years dealing with what the King James calls an issue of blood. We don't know exactly what the problem was, except that there was some sort of hemorrhaging or something that's taking place that would not stop. For 12 years, losing blood would have left her very weak, struggling just to go on from day to day in life, we see that whatever resources she had had, they were all gone by this point because she's given everything she had to one doctor after another in hopes of finding some sort of cure. It says that she had suffered under many physicians. And I wonder, even as I read that, there's the suffering of the illness, but what other sufferings has she faced? Sometimes the treatments, especially in days like that, when you're there, there's not a whole lot probably of medical knowledge going on at this point. What kind of things has she tried? to get her healing. But her suffering had gone on and on, and in fact, we're told that the situation was getting worse. 
So there's a physical cost to all of this. There's a financial cost that comes with trying to find treatment for this illness. But what we don't see in the passage here are the tremendous social and spiritual costs that also also would have come to her life. You have to remember she lived in a time when Jewish religious law governed the day-to-day lives of the people. And under this law, this woman's bleeding would have rendered her perpetually unclean. This meant that no one was supposed to have any sort of physical contact with her. She had to keep her distance from people everywhere she went. If she had a husband, she could no longer embrace him or enjoy life with him. If she had kids, she could not hug them or kiss them or play with them or comfort them or tuck them into bed at night. She would have been completely alienated from her family. She would have been unable to fulfill her role as wife and mother. And she would have been completely shut out of religious life. Because of this issue of bleeding, she would not have been able to go into the temple. She would not have been able to go into the synagogue. She would not have been able to gather to worship with anyone. She could not offer sacrifices. She could not gather to pray or to hear the scripture taught. Really, much like this leper that we meet back earlier in this gospel. A total outcast with no hope for the future. But, like that leper, she also had heard about Jesus. She knew the things he had done. She had heard the testimony coming from all around of the ways that he had worked one miracle after another, and she was desperate enough to lay aside the laws and the traditions and to come to the Lord and to seek her healing. Verse 27 tells us that in the midst of the crowd, she pressed through and touched his cloak, saying to herself, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. This woman had found no hope under the care of many physicians. But she believed in the power of the great physician. And her desperate act of faith, we see, paid off. Somehow she made her way through the crowds. She got close to Jesus so that she was able to reach and just to lay a hand on his cloak. And verse 29 tells us that when she did that, that immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. That, by the way, that's that's the healing power of the Lord Jesus. Immediate and undeniable. Healing, cleansing. What have we seen in miracle after miracle? When the Lord steps in, it's done. And so with just the touch of his garment, this woman is healed. She receives the blessing that she was looking for, but she probably didn't expect what would come next. Verse 30 says that Jesus, who's on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, who's on the verge of death, that, that, that Jesus just stops, dead in his tracks. And he demands to know who it was that's just touched him and received healing. He had felt the power go out of his own body to this individual, and he wanted to know who it was that had touched him. Now, the disciples thought, That's kind of ridiculous. What do you mean who touched you? There there are people all around you and every one of them is trying to touch you. How, How would you say, who touched me? They're coming at you from every side, Jesus. Everybody reaching out, wanting to put a hand on them. What do you mean? Who touched you? But Jesus looks around and he's looking for this one who has received mercy. Now, let me just say, I I don't think Jesus was actually ignorant at this point. I don't think when Jesus says, who touched me, that he doesn't know. I think he knows exactly what's going on here. This is not a surprise to Jesus. I think he's using this moment to teach and to bless. He knew the woman. He knew the disease. He knew everything she had suffered under it for so long but he wanted to bless. So Jesus says, who touched me? And he looks around, and the woman knew that she was the one that he was looking for. Verse 33 says, knowing what had happened to her, she came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Lord, understand this this is what I've been facing. This is what I've been dealing with for, for years now, and I've gone everywhere I could, and no one could help me, but I, I heard your story, and I, I, I knew that if I could get near you, that, that, that you would be able to heal me, and I knew if I could just touch your clothes, that would be all it would take. 
And I reached out and I touched your garment and I felt it and I know and I can tell in my body I've been healed, I've been made well. She tells them the whole story. Now we can be certain that this fear and trembling that she has in this moment would have involved a bit of social anxiety. She knew that what she had done was against the law, that it could have put her at risk in any number of ways. But she also knew that she had been healed. She knew she was in the presence of the one whose power and holiness were unmistakable. I believe she knew that this was the one who had been promised, who was with her even then. What do we see this morning, by the way? If you were in our small groups, this land of Zebulun and Naphtali, that's the region of what? Capernaum. This is where Jesus is, even in this moment. The one who's going to be light into darkness, who's going to bring uh, glory out of the gloom. That scripture is being fulfilled in this moment. Jesus looks at her in the midst of her fear and trembling as she has fallen down before him. And he puts her fears to rest. Verse 34 tells us that when she had finished telling her story, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Literally, Jesus says there, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace and be healed of your disease. There are two different words that are used there in the Greek, which tells us that this woman had received a double blessing, a double healing. Yes, her disease has been cured, but she's received more than that. By coming to Jesus with faith that he is able, believing, I, I, I'm convinced that, that this was this fulfillment of the promise of God that's come to work among them now. She comes in faith, she reaches for his garment, wanting to receive healing for her body, but I believe she's getting healing for her soul. So not only is her disease healed, but her, her sin is being cleansed. Her faith in Jesus has brought her to him as Savior. I think that's why he calls her daughter. She's become a child of God. And so this encounter has turned out to be a lot more, I think, than she expected it to be. And her life would never be the same. Jesus wants to know who touched him, but it's not to rebuke, it's to bless. And he says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your disease is healed. Well, in verse 35, the story shifts back again to Jairus and to his daughter. We're told that while Jesus was speaking with the woman, a messenger came from Jairus' house and told him, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now, again, I think this lends to a proper interpretation like we see here in Mark. He knows his daughter is on the cusp of death, and during the time that he's come to seek Jesus, she dies. But this messenger from the house comes and he tells him, she's dead now. It's too late. It's done. So why trouble the teacher any further? From this servant's perspective, it was over. Though Jesus might have been able to heal the little girl while she was alive, surely there was nothing he could do for her now that she had died. But Jesus was listening. He heard the words of this servant, and he had other plans. So what does he say to Jairus? Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Don't let your sadness overwhelm you. Don't let your heart be swallowed up in doubt and despair. Trust me. Do not fear. Only belief. Now at that point, Jesus ordered the crowd and even most of his followers to stay behind. Taking only Peter and James and John, he went with Jairus to his house. And when they arrived, the morning had begun. It says there that when they arrived, that Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Now while Jairus and his family and his friends, they were genuinely mourning, Many of those who were there in the midst of this commotion, weeping and wailing, probably had no real connection to the family. It's an interesting thing that in those days, the law required that 
a very public and prolonged period of mourning take place when someone died. Members of the family were required by law to tear their clothes and to weep and to wail. But the law also required the hiring of professional mourners. It seems very odd to us in our day and age, but that was the expectation. It was the job of those folks to express very openly the hurt that was associated with the dead one's loss. At the bare minimum, the law required even the poorest of families to hire at least two flute players and one wailing woman. And the wealthy would often hire many more. So these musicians would come who would play very sad and very dissonant music to create a scene of despair. And the women would cry and scream without ceasing and create quite a scene. Tony's not here with us right now, is he? He's probably gone over to hear Gabe preach. He could probably tell us about some interesting services he's been a part of where the morning went to the next level. I've certainly experienced that a few times as a pastor, and sometimes you don't even quite know what to do. But these are people who would have been paid to come and be a part of creating all this commotion, weeping and wailing loudly. Well, Jesus walks into all of this, just, just a, a terrible commotion, and he quickly puts it to an end. We're told that as he entered the house, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And what happens? Verse 40 tells us they did what? They laughed at him. Now, I'm going to say this is probably a reference to the hired mourners and not the family. If you're a mother and your daughter is dead, I don't think it probably matters what anybody says in that moment. You're probably not going to laugh. You're weeping. You're broken. Jesus says, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping, and they begin to laugh at him. I think this is a reference to the hired mourners. They mourned for a living. It was their job to go be sad when people die. And whether or not this deceased person meant anything to them at all, they still went, and that's what they did. So I think it would have been very easy for them, as people who are constantly being associated with death, who were paid to come and cause a scene, it would be very easy for them to shift from weeping to laughing without any real emotional attachment. But these folks did know death. And the girl was undoubtedly dead. And so as far as they could tell, Jesus is speaking nonsense here. So they laugh. Well, thankfully, Jesus never worried that much about the opinions of the crowd. He didn't really care how they would respond to him. They could laugh if they like. Jesus had other plans. And we read that he puts them all out of the house. He takes Jairus and his wife into the room where the daughter lay. And it says that Jesus took the girl by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. In that moment, he is speaking life into her. And we're told that immediately, again, immediately, not after a big scene, not after a lot of thumping and jumping and yelling and screaming, not after a few hours of chest compressions and whatever else, like Jesus says, get up. And what happens? She gets up and she begins to walk. They say, for she was 12 years of age. In other words, this isn't a baby. This is, this is, a, this is a, a growing child. Well along in years, 12 years of age. She gets up and she begins to walk. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Jairus and his wife, marveling at the miracle that's unfolded before them, overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. And I'm going to say probably ready to go out and shout, to jump for joy in the streets at what the Lord has done. And yet, what do we see here? Verse 43, just as he's done many other times when he has worked these miracles, what does he say to them? It's not the time for that. Don't, don't go out and, and make a scene. Just keep quiet for the moment. Take your girl. Get her some food. Just feed her. Love her. Hold her. Keep her close. There'll be time for the rest of that later. But right now, just keep quiet and go care for your daughter. You think about these last couple of chapters, what do we see? 
if a fledgling religious movement on the wrong side of earthly powers that are hell-bent on its destruction. A group of storm-tossed fishermen in a sinking boat with no expectation of reaching the shore. A man overwhelmed by forces of darkness that had totally wrecked his life, left him naked and alone, living among the tombs. A suffering woman who had spent all that she had in hopes of a cure, but only got worse. A dead girl being mourned by those she loved. In every case, people that we would say were beyond hope. They were, as we might put it, lost causes, each and every one of them. The people involved in their situations had given it their best. They had done what they could do to try to overcome their issues, to get past their problems. They had devoted themselves to bringing some sort of change, sparing themselves suffering, saving their lives, doing whatever they could do. They had laid aside comfort and money and power and prestige and dignity and whatever else in hopes of finding some sort of relief. And in every case, when they had done all that they could do, they still came up lacking. They could not, in among themselves, get what they so desperately wanted and needed. Every earthly attempt had come up short, but they had not yet experienced the power of and the blessing that comes from knowing and experiencing Jesus Christ. In every one of these cases, what do we see? Once Jesus intervenes, hopelessness gives way to hope. Lost causes are being won. That that fledgling movement that looks like it's going to be over before it begins, it loses its leaders when he lays down his life for his friends. But his resurrection and the sending of his Holy Spirit would empower that movement to reach the ends of the earth. And God's kingdom continues to expand even in our day. These fishermen who were so sure that they would die, they found deliverance from the Lord in a way that troubled them. But would serve ultimately to strengthen their faith and help them when they would face greater trials in the future. A man whose life was wrecked by the very forces of hell was given a home in heaven and became an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus in his homeland. A woman who had been driven to poverty and utter despair and isolation by an incurable disease found healing for her body and more than that, healing for her soul. And a little girl who had passed from life to death was restored to life once more. And the mourning of her family turned into celebration. Stories like this are repeated all through the ministry of the Lord Jesus. We see them in the ministry of his apostles. And we see them in many regards, even in our own day and age. Now look, we, we, we may not personally be experiencing some of these things like we read in the Gospels, and I'm not suggesting that we should be seeing quite these same sorts of things taking place. But I think it's undeniable that God is still at work. He is still a God who's working miracles. He's still growing his kingdom. He's still calming storms and freeing the oppressed and healing the sick and giving life out of death. So often we can look at our circumstances and we think that's it. It's over. There's no hope here. But God is in the business of restoring our hope. Sometimes we look around us and we see the circumstances around us. And I'm thinking so much about what we talked about in Sunday school this morning. We look at all the despair that is around us and we think, man, if only there was something that could be done. If only there was some kind of hope here. If only there was some way that we could be delivered. Well, we have a deliverer. And we think about these lost causes, those who are, who are just broken beyond repair, who are lost beyond any hope of being restored. Well, frankly, who are we? Apart from Christ, apart from his gospel, apart from the healing power that comes through his life and his death and his resurrection, every one of us were a lost cause, apart from his mercy. Because of our sin, we stand condemned, and yet God sent his son into the world to live, to die, 
to be raised from the dead, to now rule and reign in heaven. And he sends forth his gospel so that we may hear the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to him in faith. And for everyone who does that, what does he promise us? Healing, deliverance, glory, eternal hope, a promise of things that will work in this life and things that will go far beyond this life. The eternal hope of glory. We may think that we are beyond hope, but then comes Jesus and everything changes. We need to be reminded that God is always working and Jesus still has power to save. There is no one who is beyond his reach There is no one he cannot redeem and restore and make whole. So whatever you may be facing, know this. You are not beyond God's reach. He has the power to make you whole. And the love that gives him the will to do it. And so rather than doing what so many do, turning away from the Lord, turning to despair, looking for every other possible solution, what do we do? We run to the Lord. We seek him out. And we see what gift of mercy it is that he is ready and willing to pour out upon us. God gives us hope in the midst of hopelessness, and he does it through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I wonder, are you trusting in him? Do you believe that he can rescue you? Now, look, I, I don't know what's going on in your, in your life day to day. There, there are all sorts of struggles that we face. And certainly, we may be looking for a quick way to get out of those things, and we'll look to any other worldly way to try to intervene in that. Know that ultimately, our hope has to be in the Lord. And know this, that, that beyond the temporary troubles of this life, and that's what the Bible tells us they are. We have momentary light afflictions that we have to deal with while they're here. They may seem like a big deal. And I don't want to downplay those, but look, in light of eternity, whatever struggles we face here, they're not going to be that much. Because we have hope that goes so far beyond whatever we may face in this world. Are you looking to Jesus as the one who can deliver and to save? Do you have confidence in that hope that comes through the cross and through the empty tomb? I appeal to you this morning by the mercies of God, put your hope In the Lord Jesus Christ, he stands ready to save. Turn from your sin, call upon him as the only one who can save. And the Bible says he loves to rescue and to redeem. Put your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. This man came looking for healing for his daughter. A woman came looking for healing for disease. And Jesus gave them what they were seeking. And he gave them so much more. And I believe he's still in the business of doing those sorts of things today. Come to the Lord Jesus. Receive his mercy. He is ruling and reigning as Lord over all creation. And you can find hope in him. Listen, if, if the Lord is working in your heart, in your life somehow, you, you wonder about these things and you wonder if this can be true for you. Look, we'd love to talk to you about the gospel. We'd love to talk to you about the mercy that God has for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'd love to walk you through what the scripture teaches and to help you as you want to call upon the Lord. If that is, is stirring within you and you desire those things, look, we want, we want to guide you there. Come find one of us when this service is over. We'd love to have that conversation. Grab somebody next to you and say, look, I just, I just need to know what this means to follow Jesus. Look, we're here. We want to talk about those things. We want to help you there. And we want to rejoice with you as the Lord moves and delivers. So look, if the Lord's working in your heart, come to him and receive his mercy. Whatever else the Lord may be doing, we'd love to walk with you through that. And so know that there are people here who love you, who care for you, and are ready to walk with you through whatever may come. But look to the Lord Jesus. Find the mercy that only he can bring. And find your hope in him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, We delight this morning in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in his mercies that are new every morning. We rejoice in the deliverance he gives us in this life, but more than that, the deliverance he gives us in the life to come, the hope of eternal glory, the promise of salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, even though we live in a world that is still marred by sin, 
Our lives so often can seem broken and busted up, and we can seem sometimes as if there's no way out for us. We may think that, but God, we know that you have mercy and that you deliver. God, we saw this morning as we gathered in our small groups with a, a nation that was under siege and said, we don't know what to do. Well, let's look for another nation to come in and help. They feared everything going on around them, but they'd forgotten what it meant to fear the Lord. God, would you help us to fear you so that we can find you to be our sanctuary, our rest, our redeemer. God, light has come. A child has been born who has lived and died and who lives forevermore, who rules on the throne of his father David forever, who promises us eternal glory in his presence forever, free from every hurt and pain and sickness and disease and even death itself. God, would you help us work in your spirit so that we can see this Lord, this Christ, so that we can turn to Jesus and find rescue from our sin and from every other thing that besets us. Help us to find our hope in him alone. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Folks, it has been good to be with you today. Remember this afternoon, 3 o'clock, if you want to bring some stuff to pack a shoebox, we'll be here doing that. And then Wednesday evening, we'll gather in the fellowship hall, a little Q&A time with Derek and Lauren on the hot seat. Look forward to that discussion. Have a great afternoon. God bless.